same day that he left, I was sitting in the office and I had this old black and white television on and I saw my boss being beaten. He had been attacked by this, this mob of white parents outside the school. He had gone to the school to report as a journalist. I think he was mistaken for some of the, the, uh, one of the parents. And uh, he, was, he was jumped on, he was choked. He was, uh, it was, his picture was on Pravda in Russia. I mean, you know, he was really uh, uh, destroying the image of America abroad uh, by, by uh, you know, they, they were sure, they were helping to, to say how bad America was, but by showing his man being beaten. And I just could not believe that, you know, my boss, who was so uh, quite dignified and uh, always uh, just you know, so well put together, was just was just beaten. And they kept saying, "Run, run!" Because he he had a car that he had parked, and he refused to run. And uh, they you know they they, they choke hold him, choke hold him. Around his neck, and uh, uh, he, he managed to get away. And uh, so I just had to go to the I said, I'm sorry, I've got to go. And I called the weather, was the same photographer that I would later call to go with me to Mississippi, and we drove to Little Rock. And, uh, just, you know, to see him there, he, he wouldn't go to the hospital and stay. I don't know if he went to the emergency room, but he was he was there at the home of Miss Daisy Bates, who was the leader of the Little Rock Nine. And uh, he, he looked up and he, he, he barked at the photographer and he said, why don't you bring that girl over here? And, um, you know, he said it was her idea. <laughs> and uh, it was my idea. Uh, I, I guess... By then, the journalist blood was already in in me, and uh, I just I just had to go. And it turned out it never occurred to me that no, that could happen to me because it really could. I mean, it really could have happened. It could have happened to me in Mississippi. Um, it could have happened to me in you know many many places in the South. Uh, so, and one of the the journalists, uh, his name was Moses Newsom. And he was under Baltimore paper. He said, "You know, we went south. We just prepared as, we, as if we were going to war." Wow. And that's exactly the way. Yeah. I did. Yeah. Right. Yes, he was with Baltimore Afro American, and actually, he's still alive. And he, he called me when the book came out, and he called and said, "May I speak to the Trailblazer?" But think about that. The black press was always front and center telling these stories before, I guess, mainstream, for lack of a better term, decided to jump on. And when they did, they had to start hiring us. I am still impressed, though, for you to see someone you look up to and to see that, that interaction and still say, okay, I need to be in this. I need to do this. That's good out. Yeah, and I think the other thing that stood out when I went to Little Rock, uh, when Mr. Wilson was beaten, was uh, the other journalists, other black journalists who were there, and they told their stories and what they confronted. And, uh, you know, I thought, you know, we've got the civil rights movement, people are marching in the streets, you know, I've got to take some, uh, I've got to take some chances too. And I think it's important to realize that it was the civil rights movement that led to the women's movement. Mm -hmm. And after the women's movement, the gay rights movement. I mean, uh, I, I can remember, I know Gloria Steinman, I remember reading her first article, and it said, you know, after black power, woman power. And so, you know, this we've just been that kind of minority that have tried to open doors. And of course, that spread all over the world. I mean, in China, you know, they were singing "We Shall Overcome," and, and um, you know, you name it. Did you say they were trailblazers? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I, I am 
Wait, well, I apologize. <laughs> well, bringing us into the whole black press thing, black press then and now, um, at a time when we do have the message that we are the enemy of the people, just the press in general. Um, do you see the role of black press being necessary today? Uh, I do. Yeah, I think there's still a role for the black press. Uh, and I think it will, it will continue to thrive. I just would also hope there would be more people who would subscribe and they, that they would be able to continue their work because I think they point out issues uh, that the mainstream media really may not think about. And even when I was an editor at the Post, I would go into the Post with, you know, I have black newspapers with me, I take Ebony with me, you know, trying to uh, see what ideas could we get into the paper because one of the things I wanted to do was to share uh, with all Americans, you know, what black culture was about because it had been so distorted for so long. And so we, were, we wanted to try to get out some new truths. Can you see the infatuation with black culture and the fact that some people are discovering, they're supposed to discover? Um, some things that we've known forever, that we've done forever, everything from Bantu knots, um, cornrows, <laughs> our music. I mean, music's always been the one where it's like, yeah, this is our music, and yet to see it across all of America and not embrace as much. You had a chance to be that voice where the voice was to say, oh, no, no, let me give you a reference point. It started with, so you always felt your role, even throughout the 60s to now, and I mean, we're still fighting great fight here. Yeah, and I, you know, I think it's important that we remember that uh, an inclusive America is a strong America. You know, it really means it's a place that, where we recognize, you know, the, the, what each group brings to the larger whole. Uh, I think that's that's where we want to go. Gotcha. Speaking of inclusion, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he had a message out there when you were a cub reporter uh, motivating black people to seek places in white corporations and institutions. So that's what you were doing back then. Is it still necessary for us to be pushing to be in these arenas, to be in your seat as an editor and a columnist at the Washington Post? Is it still, is the fight still happening? Uh, I, I think the need still exists. Uh, to what extent the, the, the fight is still occurring, I'm not certain. Uh, I think uh, it helps when you know somebody like me writes a book and recalls what was done in the past and hopes that perhaps some things might be replicated uh, because they do work. Uh, for example, I, when we would talk to write editors about we need more diversity, we need more women, we need more uh, uh, black people of color, and um, they would often say, well, we can't find any qualified. They're still saying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they're still saying that the same excuse. And we knew that was a lie, but we knew that we had to go beyond just saying uh, they're wrong to taking action. And that's when we banded together and started the Institute for Journalism Education and started the summer program for minority journalists. And then we started the summer program for editors and the summer program for managers. So um, sometimes when you hear uh, something that burns your ears because you know it's the truth, uh, it's not enough just to to, to say, you know, those terrible people did this, you have to you have to take action and prove that this, you know, well, we have to find creative ways to, to uh, make a difference. And you can do that. And I think there's a big role for millennials, you know, to keep making a difference. I'm sure you already are. I hope so. <laughs> um, representation is important. Uh, just having a black face and a white face is not enough. Uh, what are some of the attributes that people should be bringing to the table? Because you could get, uh, there's just so much diversity out there, but at the same token, you know, users are being skimpy when it comes to how many people can bring up. Um, freelancers. So what do, I guess, the managers need to be thinking about? when selecting that quote-unquote person that they are hoping will bring another voice to their newsroom? 
Well, I think there are two sides of it. So what the manager should be thinking about, but also it should be what the people who want to go into the new job should be thinking about. Please, and so I'll yeah. talk about that first. Yes. Uh, I think one thing is is to really try not to take what happens personally. Uh, it's so sometimes it becomes so hard, but uh, it's, it's really bigger than the individual. And uh, so if you're in these situations and you find that that you are, uh, you know, being discriminated against, or uh, sometimes uh, it's it's good to realize that okay, this is bigger than me. And I think emotionally, it it, it helps. Uh, if you're not, you know, reacting and feeling that everything that happens that you know shouldn't be happening, uh, you know, is is uh, either personally going to happen to you, or that that uh, <coughs> personally you can change it. How um, long do you have to deal with that? Um, well, I guess you know, many of us have been dealing with it all our lives. But um, but that doesn't mean that you stop fighting, you know, and it doesn't mean that you you take it so personally that you are unable to fight. And there are some very difficult situations that journalists walk into. I have to say that I was talking to you upstairs, and you you talked about when as a journalist, you know, well, you know, I was thinking about when you said you. Walked up, uh, you walked up to some house and you heard oh, somebody yeah. talking, yeah. talking yeah. with gun <laughs> inside. Yeah. Because, you know, they. There's a warning. Like, there was yeah. a warning, yeah. yeah. I didn't get shot, thank God. Yeah, there was mm -hmm. a little warning right there. But, okay. But that doesn't, mean, that. that doesn't mean that you don't necessarily want to stop being a journalist. No. But yeah. it does mean that, um, you know, what the end could be and what you're going to do so that the end won't be there. What can newspapers do, even though they're in, in general, uh, financial straits? I mean, the Post, now that it's owned by Bezos, is in a particularly good place, uh, money-wise, as you know. But um, most newspapers aren't hiring that many, um, and it's expanding, and it's, it's too bad. It's, it, we really need, uh, you know, good med uh, legacy media now that's um, giving us some hard information, and I think the books and the Times are the ones that are still doing that. But um, I think there's something managers can do. One thing that uh, one manager did that I really admired, when USA Today started, uh, and he wanted diversity, he gave bonuses to the managers who could find diverse staff. Bring that back, please. <laughs> And and it worked, and, and it worked. you know. And you and you could look at that and say, well, why would you do that if you're, you know, if the money is falling? You know, we are we're a changing country, and we we need uh, to have representation from all communities as part of the decision makers, as part of the people who are uh, putting out the news, who are writing, uh, just so that we begin to understand each other. You know, and uh, that we can have conversations with people who don't just look like us. You know, America. We, we just have to to change if this nation is really going to, you know, be all that we can be. And other selling points, since our uh, it is a business, the more you recruit diversity-wise, the more you can speak to a larger audience and appeal to another audience. I don't know how many of you guys are in the audience. Um, growth and cultivation at your different news organizations, but there's such a high emphasis on how many followers do you have? Uh, have you built up your social media? Like, real real talk, a lot of your legacy organizations say they want the next generation of readers, but they're not doing the steps to attract the next generation of readers or viewers or listeners. So if you diversify your workforce, you got a better chance.